Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, SCAR video series on uh, SCI and COVID. Uh, today we are discussing, we've got a panel of experts with us, but we're going to discuss social isolation and its specific effect on people with spinal cord injury. Uh, my name is Matthew Carey. I'm the uh, research coordinator for SCAR Professional. And uh, like I said, we've got a panel of experts that we're speaking to today, and uh, I'll just get everyone to introduce themselves. Maybe start with Linda. Hi, I'm Linda Hunt. I'm one of the research participants at ARC, the Physical Activity Research Center at i in Vancouver. Um, I'm also involved, along with Brad, with the Community Engagement Committee there. It's one of our volunteer commitments. I also am a retired social worker and I do volunteer work at Van Dusen, so I haven't been doing much there of late, but uh, I do the other volunteer work as well. That's me. Great. Uh, Brad? Yeah, much the same as Linda there. We know each other from Park. Uh, beyond that, uh, I'm also a volunteer with Canuck Place Children's Hospice and Ronald McDonald House. Uh, that also, both of those are on hold for the time being. Um, and beyond that, yeah, just um, making my way through this one day at a time. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Neal. I work part-time at GF Strong in the Spinal Cord Injury Unit, and I work part-time in private practice as well as a psychotherapist. Great. So thanks, everybody, for joining us today. So as mentioned, I uh, wanted to discuss social isolation in the time of COVID, and uh, specifically with regards to people with SCI. Um, I guess the first question uh, I want to ask how everything has been for you, in particular, Linda and Brad. Um, I know how connected you guys are into your communities because we met at Park, as you mentioned, at i -Cord. And uh, so what kind of adjustments have you been making um, as of late? And uh, what are you doing to stay connected? You know, as the days and months go by, there's different challenges as, as, those, as that time sort of mounts. Um, there are days when I'm not sure whether I'm looking backwards or looking forwards. And uh, really, as I mentioned, really trying to focus day to day. But um, it, it is a challenge as things uh, move forward. Um, and there's, there's still some a uh, big degree of uncertainty. What do you think, Linda? Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. I mean, we certainly spent a considerable part of our lives involved with Park. And that's, mm -hmm. that's gone, even though it shifted to online. Um, is still not quite the same thing, though you do get to interact a little bit with people and have a bit of a workout. And, and luckily, both of us have something we can do cardio-wise at home, me with your ski erg and me with my, my rowing machine. I found it hard to start with um, initially just trying to get into, figure out, get a routine, because I was just consumed by all this news that was coming all the time. I'd pick up my cell phone and read and you get sucked into all the stuff and uh, some of which was probably not always appropriate and some of which was as you tried to sort it out but it really helped me when I shifted my cell phone out of my bedroom and stuck it in the uh, kitchen so that I, I made a point not to look at it at all until after I had uh, done my yoga and my stretching physio exercises and got washed and dressed and did a row or something like that and then when I came in to have breakfast then I would look at it and I made it into more manageable, manageable chunks. In fact, for a while there, I thought, oh, I can handle this. I mean, Brad and I remember you and I were talking about it, you know, both of us had lots of things going on and this was doable. Mm -hmm. But as times have gone on longer, it um, it's kind of like, I could do this for a while, but I'm not sure how long a while at the level is and how to kind of make that a little better. I mean, I, I live alone um, and I miss, touch and hugs. I'm a touchy huggy, such a worky type. <laughs> and so I really do. That's a real, um, a loss for me. Um, and so I think, well, how long can I go on without doing it? And my volunteer work gives me a lot of satisfaction. I love being involved in community mm -hmm. and giving back. And so how do I get involved? I mean, I've, we tried other ways of reaching out to people by phone and just trying to keep in touch. And we'll talk touch base on that later. But it's sort of that rhythm of things, you know, you get into it, you think this is, this is good, this is manageable, I'm strong, I can do all this. So heaven knows we've dealt with one or two things in our lives, right, crap, <laughs> we can figure this out. But then when it gets on, it's kind of like, okay, I'll figure out this next little loop. So yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting process to say the least. Yeah, I know I certainly got uh, 
in a way got excited at the beginning thinking I was going to get to a lot of things, you know, that I put on the back burner and thought, oh, you know, a couple of months this by the time summer rolls around, we'll be back to normal, no problem. But uh, as I said, the days start to mount up and you start missing that stuff for sure. I noticed, Linda, when you were making that comment about how much you were missing that physical connection and physical touch, we were all nodding our heads along with you there. So I think that is somewhat something that's um, really commonly felt right now. And one of the things that can be really important to keep in mind is how important that social connection can be for us. I mean, certainly there is a lot of difference there in terms of whether we consider ourselves more extroverted and recharge our batteries with that more social connection or whether more of an introvert and might go for that connection and then recharge by ourselves. But certainly looking at the idea that social distancing uh, is different than physical distancing. And we want to be able to physically distance throughout this pandemic for our health and safety, but really trying to ensure that we are not socially distancing ourselves more than we absolutely must within the circumstances here. And there, I think we can do a lot of different things. Um, Linda, it sounds like you've done some really nice structuring. Brad, it sounds like you were thinking about some different hobbies along the way there and different things to support mood I'm hearing there and just support that feeling of well-being. We can think about different ways to structure our day-to-day -day lives and structure our routines so that we're most likely to feel that kind of pleasure and reward and liking that we get from some of those activities, even when it is also the case that our options are more limited and we have made uh, a lot of adjustments along the way here. And one of the things I think kind of piggybacking on some of the stuff we said earlier is, is um, you know, that day to day is not so bad. You know, you get through, you get up, you get into your routine, you, the things you you want to get done, um, depending on the weather, you get out, go for a walk or wheel or whatever it is. Um, one of the challenges that I find is when I do get into that trap of starting to think, oh, how long is this going to go on? Am I going to be doing this tomorrow and next week and next month and, and uh, next year? Like, is it going to be the same next year? And I think that's where... You know, I definitely start to struggle. I do okay day to day, but when you start to look look way ahead and even sometimes looking back and going, how long I've already been doing this, mm -hmm. I kind of go, hey, I've put in my time. I'm ready to move on. Um, I don't know what you think, Linda, if you feel kind of yeah. the same. But. Yeah, and talking about the friends, because, you know, we do the reaching out and when we first thought there was all this, almost like a camaraderie. We're mm -hmm. all in this together. And I was touching base with my, my relatives in England and some friends there and touching base with people I hadn't touched base with for a long time and thought, oh yeah this is this is kind of manageable but when you start looking at the other stuff the the daily stuff I think yeah I can do this and I'm getting all kinds of things accomplished that I would never have accomplished if I hadn't been here I mean I have the most organized t-shirt drawer imaginable thanks to uh, <laughs> Netflix and Marie Kondo <laughs> which would never have happened before but you know other all, all kidding aside I think there are things that that I do feel were beneficial and I feel I don't begrudge that time in the, in the beginning because I, I felt I was connecting with people that I hadn't connected with for a bit or connecting on a different level and um, now it's more connecting for other reasons so sometimes a wee bit of that edge that they will get in a bit later but mm -hmm. I still feel that um, I've lost I wouldn't want to say the enthusiasm I don't know if I was enthusiasm I'm going to put up my hand and say oh yeah we really like to deal with this but um, I'm, I'm not quite as um, cavalier, shall we say, about it in terms of the, the coping and, and looking back. I, I think the same thing, Brad, as you. It's kind of like, yeah, I get up. In fact, today I thought, okay, this would be a nice drive, day to go for a nice drive and poke around the valley and check out the farms and the berries and everything that's going on. But um, it takes more planning to do that, and I don't know how realistic it is. So, yeah, that's where I'm at. I think those are really fair points that you're both raising and really important ones too, because they are very common experiences as we've moved from this looking like at the beginning, something that could be shorter term and evolving into something that has been going on for a number of months. And we're looking towards the fall and winter, wondering what that could look like as well. And so I think, you know, we're thinking of a couple different things here as we're thinking about how we can accept this reality that we find ourselves in 
even when it's the case that we didn't ask for it, we certainly didn't choose it, and we probably would not want to repeat it if we had the choice to do it again. That said, we can look at what are the things that are making it difficult for us to feel that idea of acceptance or that feeling of acceptance? What are those types of thoughts that nag at us and bring up those feelings of tension or irritation or sadness or hopelessness? What are the different parts of the routine that perhaps were helpful for us at the beginning, but as that real fatigue from the pandemic has set in, that maybe we've stepped back from and haven't been engaging with as much, like those calls with those relatives across the pond uh, that maybe we were doing a little bit more frequently before, but that we've, you know, fatigued of ourselves as well and have stepped back from. In terms of those thoughts, though, we can really take a look at are there any patterns to our thinking that may not be helpful for us, even if they are coming from a place of truth and validity there, that this is something that is difficult and is going on and is uncertain? What are the ways that these thoughts, for instance, about coping day to day or into the future, could we perhaps just gently challenge or look at from other angles? You know, Brad, looking at some of those questions, for instance, I think that you were raising that are really, really common now about how can I keep coping with this or how am I going to keep this effort going day by day? We can look at that idea of what are we afraid of happening? Is there something that we're concerned about getting ahead of us or um, falling behind in some way? And are there different ways that we can bring back that problem solving in order to try to bring back that feeling of coping with that problem there? If it's the feeling that we are um, finding our mood slipping or finding our anxiety is starting to increase, what different supports or specific techniques could we think about bringing in that could help us with those specific issues that are coming on board there. And so really giving ourselves that time and opportunity to see what could be getting in the way for us and what could be some small specific actions that we could take today or this week that could help us feel that we're coping within a difficult circumstance. Because certainly I think uh, for any of us, it wouldn't be quite fair to expect ourselves to be coping just the same way right now that we would be if we weren't in this pandemic that we find ourselves in right now. Um, but I really like the point that you made, uh, Rachel, that um, there's a difference between social isolation and physical distancing. And we really need to be focusing on physical distancing as a necessity for keeping the virus at bay and the number of transmissions to a minimum, whereas social isolating can be problematic and, and lead to um, feeling worse, coping not as well. Mm -hmm. It's certainly something where we can think of it being uh, a cycle that we can get into as well. The worse that we feel, the less motivated we feel, the less interested we feel, the less that we're likely to reach out for those connections or to even take those little opportunities that may spark up in front of us. But the less that we take hold of those opportunities, the less we get that reward, the less that we feel good, and on and on we can find it going. And so some of the challenge can be there to encourage ourselves to take those opportunities or to create those opportunities even before we feel motivated to sometimes or even when we're feeling a little bit low or having a frustrating day, but just to encourage ourselves to try to take that small step anyway and to see if we're any worse off doing that than we would have been without doing that at all. I was thinking, Rachel, when you mentioned that, I, um, I get together with a group on Zoom, we call it definitely not the book club, uh, <laughs> group of Victoria friends. And uh, we went weekly for a while, which was so wonderful. And then it got things were happening, so we changed it to monthly. So we had the first one on Saturday again for a month. And I thought, oh, I don't know if I really want to sit Saturday night. And, and But once I did that, because I wanted to do that, it was great. We spent two hours, you know, talking about this, that, and the next thing. Anywhere from the article in the Seattle to New York, New York Times and two articles on different things and chatting and all kinds of stuff. So it was a benefit. It did feel good. But I had to push myself to say, get your butt in front of the computer yeah. and do this. Whereas before, when it was weak, it's like, oh, this is so exciting. I'm getting connected with them. And that kind of, 
published the theory of it. And it fits in. I mean, when Brad and I were originally talking about it, we really wanted to say that there are some positives that come out of it. And I think, Brad, we were talking about out of the boredom, frustration, desire, and all the rest of it. There had been a lot of positives coming. And I thought about, you know, I can, I've got my sewing machine hooked up so I can use it now, change it from a foot pedal to a knee pedal, figure out how to use my rowing machine. Those are very tangible things, as well as the connecting we talked about. And I kind of had to put that in my mind and think there have been some positive and, and are continuing to be, but it's not, it's not uh, greeted as much with this enthusiasm probably. As this. I don't know if that's the way, Brad, but how would you frame that? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's definitely, you know, when I look back on it, there's definitely some things I've got done uh, throughout this that, you know, even just getting a new computer, ordering some new equipment, things that I was kind of putting off because it's a lot of work to, you know, research this stuff and find out what you really want but you know i've had the time to do that uh i would say one of the challenges and kind of maybe going off on a tangent a bit here but maybe you can speak to to linda is you know i think early on you said that we kind of were all in the same boat with this and um you know i know in our community spinal cord injured community there's a lot of people who for example don't work um you know so have a lot of time in their hands to begin with and now with this a lot of other people are going back to work, even in my circle. You know, a lot of people have gone back to work or people you kind of talk to and lean on in the early days of this pandemic. Uh, so that's been a shift for me, noticing that. Um, fortunately for myself, and I know you're much the same, that we, we do have things that we can find to keep ourselves busy and engaged, um, and even our connection with one another and other people at the gym and some of the classes. But I think for some people that is a challenge, you know, not having those, if they don't have those uh, supports, whether family or friends, as the rest of the world, so to speak, kind of gets somewhat back to normal. Um, yeah, that's, that's been a difference I've noticed in the last, I don't know, couple months, I guess, month and a half, or once things sort of relaxed a bit and started to open. Yeah, and I think that fit a bit that we were talking with too, that, um, accessibility of things I and mean, accessibility on so many levels is a, is a huge issue for yeah. our community anyhow yeah. but just that um the logistical planning like if we want to take a step forward and join everyone else even going to a patio with a restaurant or something like that or or going out to do some shopping yourself instead of the online shopping which i, I started with because i was very much isolating it's still like okay is there a washroom there is there a washroom i can access is there so there's more planning of stuff that almost is a continual, sometimes a low level, but still a barrier to us feeling like we're moving forward when other people in our group of friends and, and family maybe are doing it. So I think that's a factor too that has come into it a bit more as others are moving forward more so than it feels like perhaps we're moving forward when we're used to being so active. Yeah, it does take a bit more planning for sure. Um, you know, there are things you can do to sort of mitigate some of those risks, I suppose. If you, uh, you know, for me, I determined that I do want to be out there and be outside and do want to get back to getting my own groceries, stuff like that. So I think it's just a matter of prepping, um, maybe doing a bit more research on where the risks are, uh, even coming up with, you know, figuring out when places are open early. I know some stores open early for seniors or people with disabilities to give them a chance to get in and get out before the general public is in and it's a bit busier. So, to, you know, doing stuff like that, making the most of those opportunities for sure. And um, just prepping before I go out, you know, even stuff like having to worry about, you know, picking things up on my chair and, you know, we're always touching the rims and in your case, you know, touching handles on canes and so on and so forth, right? It's, uh, it's a lot to think about. Um, for sure. I don't know how you feel about that and what, how you look at it when you're going to go out, if you worry about it or you're thinking about it nonstop. I kind of worry about it a bit. And I also think, how much do I have to clean them? Because I take my, I got to my crutch handles and I, we forgot to preface it when we introduced ourselves that yeah. I walk with crutches, wore on crutches and uh, yeah. leg braces. Yeah. And so um, I clean them all in the morning. I do my little Forex claws, which I still got one box left. We'll see what happens after. And then I go out and I think, crikey, the minute I take my hand off to do a knob and put it back on, there it goes. <laughs> so how much does that make? How much a difference in how much prep work you have to do? And I'm, I'm running because I, I still want to do as much as I can. And I take uh, some stairs sometimes. And uh, 
granted it takes me a little while to do it, but it's, it's still important for me to feel that I can do that. But I'm running a quarry speech and I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> how clean is this as I run my Clorox bleach cloth down there, you know, and splice all wipes or whatever the heck it is. So it's kind of like, yeah, planning for that stuff. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, personally, once I've decided I'm going to do it, I do try and focus on actually enjoying what I am going to do, as opposed to trying to worry about it all the time, taking that uh, opportunity to prep before I go out, you know, having my wipes ready for when I get home, so I don't have to root around and touch all my closet doors to get to the claws, you know, with dirty hands, all that, those little things that you can kind of do to limit the stress to a degree. Um, but, you know, there's always going to be those challenges, I think, just the way we are mobile, you know, personally, I don't know to mention using a manual wheelchair, you know, you're always in contact with the ground. You know, every time you touch a door and then you're on to your push rims and back and forth and so it goes, right? So a little bit of preparation can help with that for sure. And then just, just trying to focus in the moment, you know, like, like you should all the time, but uh, especially during something like this. Yeah, good tips, good tips from everybody, uh, particularly prepping your cleaning supplies before you go out. I think that uh, definitely puts some people's mind at ease. Um, speaking of, we spoke of concentration and your, your concentration and your focus waxing and waning a little bit. I'm wondering if uh, uh, the group has, you know, um, things to say about this or, or, or some advice. Um, if, you know, your concentration wavers a little bit more than usual, or if you even start getting more moody or angry and irritable with what you're doing, like what, what, what does the group kind of recommend? What have, what have you been, what have you been doing? Um, I guess I'd start. I think that I don't know if I'm more moody or angry or whatever. You'd have to check with my friends on that one. They may, <laughs> they may give a different picture on that one. And I won't I, leave that no, up for Brad to answer. <laughs> jump in on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that I find myself getting, and I don't, I usually just let things go. And um, I find myself getting a little irritated sometimes um, about stuff that it's like, really people this is so basic and, and some of the things i'm thinking of is you know wearing a mask because i put a mask on when i go into the stores just out of respect for the people who are working there and but the same and, and getting in the elevators and i think we talked about this on another occasion the whole elevator thing is um i there was a small elevator and and someone was about to come in and um i say excuse me would you please mind waiting for the next one but she didn't have a mask on and you know it wasn't a huge elevator so she kind of was taken aback and then she did it coming down someone tried to do the same thing again I said, it's busy. and even at my strata there was a woman who said oh are you going downstairs and I said yep and she said okay um can i i'll come with you and i said well no neither of us wear a mask and it's small so i'll set it back up for you and part of me is thinking i'm saying these calmly and i'm being very polite and doing all the nice things socially whatever but part of me is going Really, people, what's the big deal for crying out loud, you know? We're not running all over the place. We've got time, we've got a richness of time. You know, there's not anything really earth shattering, but I mean, who knows what goes on in other people's lives. I, I say that somewhat glibly, but I think that that's the level of irritability I have sometimes. If, if I can make the effort and some of the things that I think we do, Brad, we have to put a little more thought and effort into this, some of the stuff, it doesn't come as easy. And, and that's when I get a little niggle about, really? Yeah, no, I think that's where my frustration lies. It's not so much within my own home or within my own head or own heart. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a great group of friends and family too who understand some of those challenges. But when you're out there in the general public, like at any time, you know, it's what it's like living with millions of people right you you're gonna have people that you know want to follow rules ones who don't ones who are gonna only worry about themselves um so that is a challenge when you're out trying to be safe and you see other people that just clearly aren't um and so you know i mean obviously they don't understand i'm sure that there's some extra risks that we we live with um and so i guess to a degree we have to take that upon ourselves and and almost think for you know, more than just ourselves. We almost have to start thinking from some of the other people we're going to encounter and what do we do when we come across people like people in elevators who maybe don't really think about the, the distancing in those situations. So I find that can be stressful, not just, you know, thinking about yourself and controlling what you can. You have to also be worried about so many other people when you're out and that 
I think for me that starts to weigh when you do when you do go out. Um, it can be very frustrating as well, and that's definitely um, you know where where I start to struggle a bit, for sure. Those are really common things that I've been hearing from a lot of folks recently, and those ideas around feeling more frustrated or more tense around other people, especially when being put in situations that you can't anticipate necessarily, um, but where you're in a situation where you're called on to be assertive or to make a quick decision about what you're going to do to balance that risk in that situation versus that protection. And Linda, I do like that um, you were kind of considering there, oh, well, you know, I, I'm kind of saying this glibly, but there might be those other things going on for them as well. And that actually can be a good technique to help ourselves, um, you know, challenge those automatic thoughts that may come up in those situations about, you know, all those different things that we would want to say to that person or what could they be thinking just to really try to practice noticing those thoughts as they're coming in and just challenging any of those ones that may be pulled more strongly in a more negative or firm direction than they might be if we were not in a pandemic or if we were feeling um, more relaxed in that situation. But I also do like what you were both saying about how you have made those choices for yourselves about what feels right or the best possible choice in those different situations. Knowing, of course, that we can't always have a clear way of knowing what the best choice may be, or even if there is a perfect choice, rarely there is. And so looking at, you know, what are the different boundaries that we feel comfortable with? And how are we going to uh, potentially have to reinforce those with other people? Sometimes that can be a little bit of assertiveness practice. So, um, you know, we all have different comforts with being able to speak up, but particularly when it comes to asking somebody else to change their behavior or to say no to someone, those are really tough situations for a lot of folks. And so sometimes it can be helpful to uh, do a little bit of practice ahead of time, whether it's just in the mirror with yourself or whether it's with another person on Zoom or uh, actually face to face to see what does it feel like when I try to speak those words? What could I say? Um, what body language do I just notice myself doing automatically? And is that helping or potentially hurting my cause in that situation? We can also look at, are there any ways that we are concerned that others may react if we do speak up in that situation? If we ask that person to wait for the next elevator, is there something that plays out in our mind about what they say or what they do? And if that's the case that we have some of these thoughts or predictions that are making us hesitant or uh, are kind of turning up the heat on that tension in those situations, we can also do a little bit of practice if we kind of put on our researcher's hat there and see if we put ourselves into those situations and collect some data, is what happens in those situations the same thing that plays out in that little mini movie in our mind? Or is there something else that happens? And if we can do that, uh, preferably a few times just to get that scientific rigor in there, what does that tell us and what can we do with that information? And so in that way, that can also be a nice way of actually diffusing um, away from some of those more painful or difficult thoughts and emotions there. Going into those situations with a goal that we're going to practice and trying to bring mindfulness to that rather than bringing that attention to that person, you know, getting too close to us or not wearing a mask, which is absolutely a difficult situation for sure. Yeah, no, I know. I really appreciate what everyone's saying. And I do know that, um, you know, people with SEI do tend to play almost an educator role with folks in general, like, because, you know, they don't know what it's like to live in a chair or to walk on crutches. So they don't know what it's like to go somewhere where the bathroom isn't accessible or what have you. Um, and, you know, it's not your responsibility per se, but in terms of what's going on now in the pandemic, but I know knowing Linda and Brad um, that you're approaching this with all the kindness and politeness that you can. And um, I think generally speaking that assertiveness will also feel good that you're speaking for yourself and, and 
mm-hmm. sort of speaking for others and helping others at the same time. Yeah. I guess that's a good point because I always think, and I used to talk with people about it, it's, it's sometimes not always comfortable to ask for things for ourselves when we're first initially getting into this. But if, if you think, as you were mentioning, the education role that I always think, well, I'm providing some support and education for other people who are in similar circumstances. It makes it seem much less selfish, it's much too, much more altruistic. Yeah, I, I know even pandemic or not, I, I feel when I'm out, there's that degree that we are, or I'm in a way representing the spinal cord injured community. And when, you know, people are watching you, you know, for example, getting in and out of my car and the way I do that transfer, and I, often people will stare, you know, and that trying to remember not to have that angry reaction, you know, you know, what are you staring at sort of thing and realizing that they're just curious. And I think that's kind of what we're doing here with this. Well, the first reaction might be to be upset or frustrated with people, you know, or to a large degree, people just don't understand. And it's, if nothing else, it's just an opportunity to educate. And while that can be exhausting and overwhelming at times, it's just trying to take a breath and remember, and go, okay, you know, it's, it's an opportunity here. Like, like, like a lot of things, you know, even through the challenges of this pandemic, it's, there are opportunities. And uh, it's trying to remember that and not, not get caught up in some of the, the negativity. Um, and I know, I don't know, Linda, how you feel, but when this whole thing first started, I was, I set up a recording on my PBR for the news every night, the local news, the national news. I wanted to be informed. I wanted to know everything. And, you know, I found after a while it was, you know, again, when I thought we'd be doing this for a few months, it was kind of, you know, it was a good thing to be informed, but as time went on and it, you get this news that, you know, it might be two years, it could be three years. I, I found that very challenging and I found that started feeding into the negativity. So I kind of stopped watching news and following up on that kind of thing, whether online or on TV. I did find then I was a little uninformed, you know, and like I said before about mitigating risks when you're out, you want to be informed and um, and well informed, you know, getting, you know, reputable um, information. I found that can be a challenge finding that balance and knowing where to, to, where to get your information, especially with a spinal cord injury too, because they're not really touching on that on the general news. Um, I don't know, you know, how do you feel about that, Linda, if you had some yeah. of the same feelings? Yeah, I was the same. I was consuming everything in the news and, you know, trying to very faithfully try and watch our wonderful Dr. Bonnie. Um, <laughs> but then it got to point, and I'm sorry, Dr. Bonnie, but I haven't seen you for a week now. Uh, so you got to, I got to the point where you just, you know, I want to keep informed and know what's going on, but I just found it was a bit too much to take in all the time and I needed to get a bit of distance mm-hmm. from it and just kind of take care of myself in that way. So that, uh, cause I found that happening to me and I guess, but I just thought, you know, when you're talking with other people about things, whether it's how much they're watching and they're finding it a bit, a bit there and that sense that we have a responsibility for others. And we kind of talked about it a bit when, you know, when you do the education role and that's taking on a certain amount. And, and for me, as you guys know, I, I have, struggled quite a bit with how to provide support for my 89 year old mother who lives in the island who who is just uh, in the early stages of a vascular dementia and as well as you know am I going to do stuff for him and what's going to work out there and, and I think that that's just a, a one extreme of the, of the continuum but from education to you know personal family stuff to friends and looking out for friends and touching base to make sure they're okay and, and things like that and uh, and I think that's something too that um, has been an important part of this whole process for me too. And just realizing like, you know, you and I from fledgling acquaintances and teasing relationship at the gym to becoming, uh, you know, friends even more. And, and uh, I think there's been a richness to some of those discussions within that responsibility of connecting with people. There's things have grown out of it. So I'm hearing for both of you, actually, I was hearing this sort of shift over time from this feeling of, oh, I have to stay connected. I have to stay up to date in part, not only for myself, but for the broader society, this kind of societal responsibility. And then over time, as we've gotten more fatigued and more tired of some of these procedures, it's shifted a little bit towards what can I do to sustain myself while also kind of balancing some of these other pressures. And I think that, you know, whenever we're thinking about those ideas of responsibility, 
which, you know, as you're saying, Linda, it's not often just one thing. Uh, responsibility can be multifaceted. And Brad, you were speaking to a couple different uh, responsibilities, even within the SEI community there. And that can feel very overwhelming. And there can be a lot of pressure that can uh, come along with those feelings of not only doing for myself, but doing for others and having to be a role model for others as well. And that can have positive and negative sides to it, of course. You know, there are ways that that can motivate us and inspire us and keep us uh, fulfilled in many different ways. But it can also be something where those pressures can um, add a lot of weight during a time that's already quite heavy in some ways. And so some of the ways that we can help ourselves to keep that balance if we're feeling that it is shifting uh, more so towards the responsibility and away from the us and wellness side is to, you know, take some time to really itemize what are those responsibilities that we're feeling. Just as you were kind of listing there, Linda, what are these different ways that I'm feeling responsible for different people or different roles in my life? And then to take that step back and say, you know, what are these ones that are most important to me? Or what are these ones that are most central for me? What is my true responsibility in there, though? If I'm feeling that I'm solely responsible for something, is that objectively, truly the case if I take the step back? And if so, what supports can I perhaps think of bringing in in order to divvy that weight in a different way? But if it is the case already that perhaps I'm feeling very, very responsible, when there are others who could also help me to share that weight or to even problem solve or to delegate, what ways can I bring back that assertiveness and uh, tap into those supports or those other folks in the network there in order to do the best that I can to balance that? Of course, within the context of a situation that is out of balance to begin with and where we're likely to feel that balance shifting on the day by day, week by week, or sometimes month by month basis. But allowing ourselves that opportunity to take that step back, give ourselves permission to check in with ourselves and see what are we doing? Where are we feeling responsible? And how can we just check in with that to see if we have to carry the extent of the responsibility that we feel. Um, and Rachel, I'm wondering if you can comment on on the other part of, of um, the comment that Brad was making with regards to this misinformation pandemic yes. that we're kind of finding ourselves in. And I know yeah. lots of people are struggling with it, in particular healthcare professionals. Yeah. Um, what, what, do you, what do you have to say about yeah. uh, information and misinformation in the time of COVID? That is such a good point, Brad, and I'm so glad that you brought that up because that idea of trying to get all the information that we can to cope with the situation is something that I think a lot of us found ourselves going to quite naturally at the beginning. And it's something that as people is, you know, quite a natural response for us. We're uncertain, we want to find answers. And we go to these different sources where we think we're going to find answers or we're hoping that we're going to find information. When we're looking at how useful that different information can be, that's where we want to try to be a little bit more critical. Um, as you're saying, Brad, it can be something that uh, can be overwhelming, but also there are different ways that we can think of information being harmful if we're getting contradictory information or information that may be applicable to some groups, but not all groups. And here is where we want to, again, try to do our best, not expecting perfection, but trying to do our best to check in with what is the evidence space behind different sources that we're using. Are these sources that have been researched if possible or uh, where there has been a peer review of information? Is this something where it is based on an opinion or something that has not been fact checked? How do I know that? So how do I know, for instance, if something is being uh, researched? We can sometimes look to see if there are links within the article to other research studies or other groups that have similar um, studies that they've put out or have given similar types of feedback. And that way we can kind of triangulate in and see what are the different sources saying that is similar. We can also think of going to uh, often the most reputable news sources in general. So we want to think of some of the bigger, um, you know, 
infectious disease and Canadian news sources. So certainly things like the uh, Center for Disease Control or CDC, uh, some of the Canadian health agencies, and then looking at, again, are the news sources that we are using, using information from some of these more reputable sources. And then also, I think the other part that you've both been speaking to is around that connection to the news. Um, how much is enough or how do I know when I should put that boundary or limit on myself to kind of take that step back. And here, I, you know, I think there's a lot of individual difference, of course, that we can speak to, but thinking about what is the amount of time that allows me to get that info that I need without feeling like I'm just ruminating without just getting stuck and starting to read those same articles over and over again in a way that is feeding worry or anxiety. And so it can be, for instance, that we're either setting a certain time of day, uh, maybe a certain window of time as well, depending on what works best for us. Um, but I think that's a really nice thought to just think of how much am I uh, checking in with those sources and is that helping me or is that feeding into any concerns? more so than it would otherwise. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Two super important points. Number one, your connection to the news source, and then number two, the news source itself, and how evidence-based is it? We here at Sky are all about the evidence base. Um, we're building a section on COVID and specific to people with SCI. So we're building that right now, so you'll be able to find that on our website. Uh, in addition, we recommend a few other sites which we found that are particularly reputable, and I'll, I'll edit in screenshots up on, onto this video. Um, in terms of plain language information in regards to uh, understanding what COVID actually is, www.flattenthecurve is great, and it has information in a ton of different languages, so that's great for our international audience. Um, if you're wondering about cases and tracking of COVID per se, uh, Johns Hopkins University has a phenomenal uh, site. It's at coronavirus.jhu.edu. Um, it has a world map as well as a U.S. map, so you can look for our American friends. You can see how your state is doing, and they've also created an educational planner. So um, by county or by state, have people um, taken into consideration the 12 most important things in terms of opening and reopening schools. So I urge you to check those out um, as well as our site uh, for SCI information specifically for Sky or on Skyr. Um, so I think we're going to need to wrap it up, but I want to give everyone an opportunity to, you know, shoe in, to horn in some final thoughts with regards to physical distancing, not social isolation, and, and SCI. Maybe I'll start with Brad. Uh, I think, I mean, I've covered, I think, what I worry about or think about. Um, I think Linda and I are in the same boat as far as how we sort of navigate each day, uh, being busy and having a lot of hobbies and interests that can keep us busy. I, I just, I'm a little concerned, maybe we've done a bit of a disservice to some of the people that maybe don't have that. I don't know if we've touched on that enough. What do you think, Linda? You know, those people that don't have the supports, um, you know, especially as we move forward, you know, even with so social distancing, if you don't have those supports, you know, it's, you are isolated, socially isolating, whether you want to be isolated or distance, you might not have a choice. That, that would be my only concern that we haven't tapped into that enough. Yeah, I agree, Brad, because I think you and I both reached out to other people just to touch base that we were a bit concerned about because mm -hmm. we know them and, and they do lead an isolated life or tend to and the gym is really a, a connection for them. So um, yeah, because we do tend to ourselves be out and about quite a bit in terms of friends and got, both of us have good family supports and yeah. other things and a richness of, of friends to be there. So um, I don't know if we're the norm. God only knows, so some of them may make a comment on that or if we're the, the isolated ones, but I do agree with you. I think there are lots of uh, people who, um, personality-wise, just coping skill-wise, whatever, do not um, have have that support. And so I think it's it's even more of a struggle. And hopefully there's things that they can connect with that Rachel's offered through our discussion that would, uh, would be good. Mm. I was just gonna say there, I think those are really good points that you're bringing up. And I think that's a great thing to be thinking about folks that aren't as automatically connected or might not 
have that same kind of extroversion that just drives that connection uh, kind of feeling. One of the things I think overall that we can think about when we're thinking about types of connection and availability of connection is what is the lens that we're viewing that through? What are the different possibilities that we are uh, considering or potentially automatically discounting? And are there any of those that we may be discounting or not giving ourselves enough credit for that actually we could consider pulling in, even if it is the case that it's a bit of an experiment to see how it is or how it goes if we try something new or try something again that we've tried before and didn't necessarily enjoy once before. Can we give ourselves that opportunity to try it out again? And I'm thinking particularly about different types of uh, either electronic groups, chat rooms, or the like right now, where um, although there are many people who are going back to work in some ways, there are a heck of a lot of folks who are still finding themselves at ends more than they used to be in terms of having time. And so thinking about different types of hobbies or interests and encouraging yourselves to take those opportunities to see, are there venues for connection that I could explore here? So just taking an example, for instance, um, say that you're really interested in art or art history. There's lots of museums right now all over the world that are offering virtual tours um, to places all over. And so it would be really interesting to see, is that a hobby where I could both enjoy it myself? And then maybe is there a way that I could connect through forums or chats or any other ways to just kind of connect with folks who have similar interests, even if it's a brand new connection? Again, am I going to be any worse off trying this than if I did not give that a shot? Sometimes it is the case that we may need caretakers or caregivers to set us up in order to be able to access technologies or different uh, routes for communication in that way. And so it could also be that this piggybacks on some of those assertiveness and problem solving uh, ideas that we were thinking about before in terms of, again, who could help me to connect or what different uh, team members do I have who could assist me in finding different routes as well. And I think this kind of leads me into something that I kind of wanted to end with as well, which is that this is a different time than we have experienced before. And we've been talking a lot about different stresses and tensions that are affecting us right now in a different way, perhaps. Um, you know, the SCI community is adaptable and resilient, but you know, everyone is certainly human. And if anyone is finding themselves in a position where there is marked change in anxiety or mood in a way that is starting to affect your life or get in the way, that could be a time when it can be helpful to just start reaching out for those supports or to think about different ways of perhaps uh, allowing yourselves that permission to seek help. Lots of different opportunities there. There are things online in terms of self-guided supports, um, whether that be different modules or just information to read. There are different ways of um, sometimes telephone coaching or email coaching that may be available. Certainly through the family doctor, uh, that's always a good resource, or directly through mental health practitioners if you've already got someone on your team. Just taking the time to think about those different opportunities and giving it a shot to see if that's something that could be helpful in this time. Hey, something to take up the time as another hobby in that way at least. So I would just um, give that gentle plug to think about those options and to not hesitate to reach out. Super important points. Thank you, Rachel, and super important discussion. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, here in Canada, we have our, our uh, provincial organizations, SCIBC, SCI in Ontario, SCI Alberta, et cetera. They're great places to reach out in terms of building your community. I know in the States, Christopher Reeve does a phenomenal job. Um, so definitely look up your local advocacy organization. Um, I also wanted to thank, as we're signing off here, um, our funders, Praxis Spinal Cord Institute and Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation for funding this work, as well as all of our partners, um, i -Corps, Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute, uh, Bless and Integrated Cares Partnership, Rick Hansen Foundation, and the University of British Columbia. 
Um, we'll be doing, if you enjoyed this video, this discussion, please like, share, and, and subscribe. Um, we'll be having another discussion with this great, with group, this great group uh, on mental health issues and SEI in the time of COVID. And uh, we also have another one that will be going up on our website about SCI specifics and some medical issues. Um, so I wanted to thank our panelists again very much, Linda Hunt, Brad Skeets, Rachel Neal, and thank you so much for your time. And uh, reach out, everybody, and uh, tune in again.